property. I get all wound up and get on my soapbox and start going. So I'm going to try and stay kind of focused and not go chasing down rabbit holes. Um, but hopefully we'll, this group's small enough. If you have a burning question, raise your hand and we'll try and address it then. But if you can, I have places where we'll ask questions and we'll answer, hopefully answer them. All right, that's me. I kind of know what I'm doing. All right, obviously I'm not gonna, this is not a teach it, do it yourself patent attorney school. You're not gonna come out of here and do your own patents. That's not what I'm trying to teach you. But I do want you to kind of know when you need help, what sort of help you can, and what sort of tools are in the toolbox. Um, I have a lot of slides. I move through them quickly because you guys can read quickly. And I don't read everything on the slide because I know that you can read. It will be good. Um, all right, so big pictures. What the hell's the point of all this? I mean, why do this? Is it just to get something to put on your refrigerator door and say, Mommy, Mommy, I got a patent? Um, when I do these talks for MBA students, I talk MBA style. And we have supply and demand curves. And if you have a kick-ass product, what happens is the demand for your product is up here. And so this means you get more. People pay more for your product than the generic brand. All right, now the problem is, if you don't protect your intellectual property, what happens is you worked your butt off to come up with this stuff. You had R&D, you had some stuff that didn't work out, you cost to advertise. The cloners just see what you got and copy it. You can take something, send it to China, and get it replicated on the market within weeks. Um, and so if you don't protect your stuff, you're, you may not get, just look, look what happened to the, the price. The price came way back down. So you're not getting any, you're not getting a premium price yet. All right, so like I said, the clones, the graph kind of said this, but people like words. Clones come in, they took no risk, their costs are less, they erode your profitability. Um, so before the clones, you were making the big bucks, after, not so much. All right, the way to ward off the clones is you gotta identify what is my competitive edge, and then you protect it to the extent you can. Not everything can be, but we do the best we can. And with protection, we keep the clones out of your space. Or we hamper them so much that, you know, we tie cinder blocks to them and they can still compete, but they're, they're really limited in what they can do because they gotta, they gotta design a crazy way of doing stuff because you've already patented the best way. All right, so for many businesses, the most common thing you have is goodwill. That's kind of what I have, is people know my reputation doing what I do and they come to me because somebody recommends them. That's true for car dealerships and beauty parlors and all sorts of stuff. And so one, if that's what your thing is, you protect that with trademarks, domain names, design patents, and other things. So basically what you're trying to do is when there's a repeat customer or someone makes a recommendation to a friend, you don't want them getting siphoned off to a Me Too product. You want people, if they're looking for your product, you want them to be able to find your product. Um, Bernie, you got one? Sorry. I'll find one. All right. Now, I spend the bulk of my time with this type of competitive thing. This is the better product. You know, you're the first person to come up with soap that floats. So pure it floats. Floats because the the guy who was running the mixer went to lunch and forgot to turn it off and they put a lot of air bubbles in the, in the spider so. Um, but anyway, you can get patents. Trade, you, sometimes you can use trade secrets. Sometimes you use copyrights to protect um, others from coming in and copying your good stuff. Um, most of the time, most of the time when we think of patents, we think of we got a better product, better features. But sometimes, we may have a better process for making. So, say our brewery friend found a way to cut two of the processing steps out and get an equal quality beer. Well, two less processing steps, his, his throughput's gonna be higher, maybe his labor costs are down. Maybe he doesn't have to buy two more pieces of machinery. So sometimes getting a patent on that, on having a smoother process can, can be worthwhile. All right. Um, 
So that's what this, if your supply curve is much less than others because you cut out several process steps and uh, or maybe you, you have less waste, um, then you have a competitive advantage. So you can still price things at the market price, but since it costs you less than all your competitors, you're making more money. And actually, Duke University, dun, 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 Duke University exists only because somebody had a patent for the first cigarette rolling, this first cigarette machine. And so while everybody else was still rolling cigarettes on their thighs, the Dukes had access to the license to this patent, and they kicked ass because their supply cost was so much better. Their supply cost was so much better than everybody else. And back then, before lawyers knew about predatory pricing and stuff, they drove people out of the market, each of the markets, and eventually they had a near nationwide monopoly on an addictive drug. So that's, that's what built the Duke University. Um, and, and it works. People do it. But anyway. Um, all right. So let's get out of NBA land and go back. Um, you can protect um, your better supply, your better uh, factory with trade secrets, patent, copyrights to keep people from improving things. I have clients. Did you know that to take firewood across state lines, you have to cook it to 165 degrees? It's a rule. It's a rule because otherwise it's a vector for moving the dreaded emerald borer beetle, um, which eats the elm trees and stuff. And so you got to cook the firewood before it goes. Well, drop, you know, because there's not much price for firewood, even cooked firewood. So having a more efficient process for cooking the firewood made them more money. Um, all right, so it's your job to figure out, geez, this is, this is why I am better than the other people. This is why people should invest in me. This is why customers should come to me. And once you figure that out, then you get the IP attorney and say, can I do something with it? Um, some things have very hard and fast deadlines and some things are kind of soft. So that's why it's good to know the general rules on the, on the early side so you don't come to a patent attorney six months after it's too late to do anything. All right, now let's go into the specific forms. All right, I love utility patents. These are the things, this is the better light bulb, the process for making the Polaroid picture and, uh, and all sorts of other stuff. Um, I could talk for six or seven hours on those, but, so I'm gonna put that at the end so that I don't talk six or seven hours and suck up all the oxygen. Um, but the good thing is, a utility patent, if you have a better way of doing something, you can get protection. It amounts for about 17 years. It's 20 years from the start of the process, but it, by the time you get done, it amounts to be about 17 years of, of protection. All right, trade secrets. Anytime you think patent, you always say, should I do patent, should I do trade secret? Like the formula for Pepsi-Cola. You know, you can have a trade secret, as long as you can keep it a secret, you can keep it secret for a long time. Now, if you're really Wonka and you trust your Oompa Loompas, then a trade secret's a pretty damn good option. If you live here and now, and you have all these contractors and subcontractors and your vendors work for six different companies and you're outsourcing stuff back and forth and you, you come up with a new uh, microprocessor but a chip stripper can cut it up and use it under an uh, electron microscope and see every transistor there, there's fewer and fewer things that we can keep as a trade secret now. So it's less and less of an option, but it is an option, especially for murky chemical stuff, like when you're mixing all sorts of stuff together and it's really hard to get a clean output on the back end. And also sometimes intermediate steps, like if you're making a microprocessor and you're doing, you know, you do an acid etch and this and you do that and by the time the thing leaves you've added 16 steps since then that might be something you can do with a trade secret because it's not going to leave a, a fingerprint as to what you did um, the trade secrets like I said are useless if it's easy to reverse engineer it um, and if somebody else independently invents this your trade secret doesn't stop them from doing it um, 
and they can actually patent the idea, and then you're kind of in the you're kind of in the worst position. All right, trademark. So we jump to a new topic altogether. Trademark is basically allows people to find you and buy more of your stuff. <coughs> right? That's all it, that that is what it is. So when you buy a Coca-Cola, it's going to be from the folks that made Coca-Cola. And that's why when you're at a restaurant and you say, I want a rum and Coke, they say, would you like a rum and Pepsi? Because they're under the gun from Coca-Cola never to sell something and call it a Coke when it's a Pepsi. So for a while, I think the Pepsi folks, their marketing thing is they call that a Cuban Libra. So the Pepsi and rum was a Cuban Libra. So anyway, so that's a trademark. So you can do all the way from the top to the bottom. So McDonald's, Big Mac, the slogan, two all beef patties, blah, 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 is a trademark thing. The trade dress, like remember the green Coke bottle? So that's covered. Um, in rare instances, you can get a, a trademark on a color so that nobody in that space can use that same color, like Owens Corning pink for insulation, because nobody has to make the damn insulation pink. Right now, you're not going to get a trademark on black tires, right? Because they go, well, it's kind of the norm is to have a black tire. It'd be really expensive to force it. But like Tiffany Blue for the little jewelry box, um, MGM Roaring Lion, a new one is dope. They got a, a patent on Homer Simpson's noise. I don't know why you would need that. I mean, they got a trademark on that. So, um, the other thing you should know about trademarks, like, like pink, right? Trademarks is like a series of little islands, right? And so you get rights to that thing on that island. So Delta, you know, I have Delta on the island of Airlines. He has Delta on the island of faucets. He has Delta on the island of insurance companies. So you can have certain words within their own little space. Um, and, uh, and so sometimes if you're doing something like you're doing Cadillac, so you're on the island of cars, but if you're selling a lot of hats and you want to prevent people from selling Cadillac logos on hats, you also got to get a trademark on the island of clothing. Um, and so sometimes, you know, and this is why you talk to a trademark attorney, they'll walk you through all this, but sometimes you have like a thing, like say you have a copy machine, and then you might also have training to train people how to fix the copy machine. And so you might need to get a, tra a trademark on the island of training. All right, so trademarks, like a lot of things, there's two tiers. There's like a state level protection. And North Carolina has some process where you register with the state. But basically, you just put a TM or an SM, you know, next to whatever word. So if I wanted to say Flynn IP law, I could put a little SM there. Um, now, if you want to supersize and upgrade, this R means you have a registered trademark, which meant that you went through the whole ritual. It's R ritual. You went through the ritual with the federal government and they, you know, pushed back and, and tried to tweak your definition of scope of work and all that kind of stuff, compared it to other people. Um, and then you get the registered trademark. And so generally, when you get the federal level of protection, it gives you a couple things. One, it gives you protection for the whole country rather than just in the state of North Carolina. So if you're cutting hair and you want to be really crazy cuts rather than crazy cuts, hair place or whatever, and you want a trademark on that, and you don't care if somebody has the same name out in California, then a state trademark might be fine. But if you're trying to come up with a new soda, then you're gonna want a federal one. And Coke messed up on this. They they got, a, they saw a trademark that there were superior rights for a local soda in Georgia that they later had to go back in and buy out those rights. Um, so if, once you get a federal mark, it kind of gets you a lot of places and it gives you a bigger hammer to hit people with if they mess with you. And a lot of times, um, and also you get to sue in federal court, which is often better than messing with state courts. So 
Um, not everything, if you start looking now, now that you know that TM is a lower class versus an R, you'll see a lot of products, famous products from big companies are just TMs. They're not necessarily an R. Um, so Kevin, is, yeah. that, is that basically uh, whoever gets there first with the trademark wins? Or if you've had a business for a long time, let's say, but you didn't trademark it, and somebody trademarked that, can you get away? Yeah, you can. They get into litigation and you have to show the prior use and stuff. You can do that. You can yeah. show the prior use. So, um, but then you might be locked to just North Carolina. Yeah. Right? So you're, their use might be everywhere but North Carolina. So, um, generally, if it's a big deal, then you should trademark it. And the other thing is, if your name is self-documenting, so like, you know, if I said, you know, a guy that writes patents or whatever, I'm not going to get a trademark on that and prevent the rest of the world from saying that they're a guy that writes patents or, you know, whatever. So the more crazy your name is and the least, the less useful it is saying what you do, then the more power you are. And where do you see that all the time? Pharma. The names of those damn products look like some sort of moon from the Star Wars. Like, an inordinate number of X's and Y's and, and, and stuff. I mean, none of those words look like anything, really. Um, and so, but if you get a word that's, you know, not necessary, like Apple is a decent trademark for computer equipment because the word Apple has nothing to do with that. Um, I had a client recently that, you know, they tried to get a trademark for like a filtering needle. I mean, we, it described what the damn product was. Their, their product, when you break a glass ampule and then you try and suck the, the medicine out of it, well, there's glass shards in there. So when you do it right, you should have a little filter that takes the glass shards out. And so this is one of the few times I said, why don't we do this name? I said, let's call it a frog. Because you can shout out, give me a frog, give me a frog. And frog stands for filtered removal of glass. <laughs> and, so they, and so I said, you know, you can get a little logo with the frog and, you know, all that stuff. Um, kind of like the Geico lizard or whatever. I mean, it's easy. People can remember that. It's a short name. And just stay away. Peppy Little Pew's got political overtimes now or whatever. Peppy the frog. So, but anyway, so, so like the word frog is not at all necessary to normally talk about a needle that filters glass shards out. But in this case, it's a nice, pithy, little short name. Um, all right. Um, I think we covered. Oh, also, you gotta police the trademark. So, like I said, you know, Coke has to be on the lookout for people using the word Coke when they don't mean Coke. And so, you need to be careful. So. When done right, a trademark is an adjective. So you buy Kodak film, you buy Minute Maid orange juice. So it's an adjective that describes the particular subset of orange juice that you're buying. Now, if you start calling something a Kleenex instead of a Kleenex brand facial tissue, um, you know, Coke, same thing. Ping pong ball, ping pong was initially a brand of table tennis balls. Um, Xerox, you know, they're pretty good at policing their mark. They don't like people talking about that as a, as a noun or a verb. Rollerblades, I think they're going to lose that one because people don't say rollerblade brand inline skates. They say rollerblades. But, um, all right, copyright. Copyright is another one where there's sort of two levels. Um, basically, as soon as you reduce something to writing, you have a copyright. Um, Holden Cawthorn from uh, Catcher in the Rye, his letters were taken and he asserted copyrights and stuff against them. Copyright merely covers the specific way that you express the idea, not the idea itself. So you can have, you know, boy meets girls, families fight, you know, that's Romeo and Juliet, it's also West Side Story. And so West Side Story can't, you know, can't be sued by Romeo and Juliet for having a very similar idea. Um, copyright, somebody needs to copy it, right? So if somebody independently comes up with the same stuff, then there's no copyright violation. Um, 
So if you, if you spend a ton of time on training manuals or whatever, you don't want someone to copy all that stuff. Um, computer software, you come up with, you know, 100,000 lines of code, and you don't want someone just blanket copying it. Um, you can get a copy from that. Um, maps, you know one of the things they do to show copying in maps? They add streets that aren't there to the map. And if it shows up on the other guy's street, then they know they copied it. Um, all right, copyright's easy, but you can also upgrade to federal registration. It's relatively simple. You can actually keep stuff secret and send it to the feds. And the only person who has access to it would be an attorney defending somebody that you're suing for copyright violation. Um, it's relatively easy. You can do computer code. You can do all sorts of stuff. Can you give an ISBN number? Is that like automatically the thing? Um, the I, I don't know. It's a short answer. Um, How about fair use? How does that apply to copyright? <laughs> that's that's a whole seminar. Yeah. Um, and, and generally, that was one of my questions. Yeah, a lot of people do a lot more with fair use than probably they could. Partially because teachers have been taught really sloppy. Um, there is some sort of educational use. And a lot of people, like they used to make course packs in colleges where they would just Xerox all this material and then sell it and, to, and, and they wouldn't give any money back to the original people. And eventually they got nailed for that. So um, I know copyright attorneys and if it's close, I would talk to them. But, you know, the fair use stuff and also as a small guy, generally by the time you're in fair use, it means you're in court, spending big bucks. And so they just were, were fighting back about the, the photographs of prints or whether Andy Warhol's series of paintings was fair use, whether, I mean, it makes my head spin. So the short answer is stay, all right, the, the job of a litigator is to take a Holstein cow, you know what a Holstein cow is, right? And the job of a litigator is to decide whether that's a white cow or a black cow. And so one litigator will say, well, as the nose goes, so goes the cow. So if it's got a black nose, it's a black cow. And the other will say, well, you need to look at the, the from a distance, you know, what sort of pixels would you get? So that's what litigators do. What people like I do is try to keep you out of the damn litigation to start with. So just live your life in a way that we minimize risk. And then you're not in litigation arguing back and forth about stuff. So I tend to be a little more conservative because generally my small guy clients, it's death just if they get sued, right? They don't have the money, they don't have huge legal budgets versus some of the big companies that my clients bump into, the division that's suing them, the, the VP with the P&L for that division, gets to call in the litigators and do their stuff and it doesn't get charged to his p &L. So basically he gets an army of free lawyers because it's just deemed corporate overhead. And so there's these weird stuff and you see these litigations happen that never should happen because it's basically free to this vice president who's looking to, to squash a little guy to keep their sales revenue up. Um, so. Be careful, be cautious. Litigation is not a good use of your time, not a good use of your money if you can avoid it. All right. All right, and then people argue back and forth, should I get a patent, should I get a copyright on software? Get both if you can. If you can get a patent on the software, go ahead and patent it. If everybody can get a copyright on the, on the software, so go ahead and get that too. In some cases, one's easier to assert than the other. Just like when you protect your home, people don't go, well, should I use a lock or an alarm? Hmm, let me think of it. It's like, use both. They both have some value. Heck, get a dog too if you want. All right, design patents. This is a topic that everybody seems to overlook, but it's out there all over the place. So what a design patent does, it covers the ornamental aspects of a product, the way it looks that makes it distinctive. Um, relatively cheap to get, um, but it's relatively thin protection. So you could get like a design patent on this outlet bus, right? So you got the, the contrasting colors, it's got the curved profile and stuff. And so if this was a really great outlet bus and you love this outlet bus, you give it these for, for presents. 
and your neighbor came over and saw how great it was and wanted to go to the store and get it, they can't remember the name. If they had a design pattern, right? when they go to the store, you can just find it by sight and, and, and buy it. So that's what a design pattern's good for. So it's good for kind of more things on the spontaneous end, like getting a design pattern on an F-16, probably not a good use of your time because there's probably relatively few people that make spur of the moment purchases of F-16s. Um, all right, but it's like all sorts of stuff. I mean, so like mop head. So if you had a distinctive mop head, and what that might be is, you know, something that has a replacement part because that's where the revenue is. And so they get a design patent on the replacement part so that people can't make knockoff replacements. Or if they do, then everybody knows. I had a client that came in, they had been dithering around trying to get um, protection for a endoscopic stiffening device, which kind of like, looked like a, you know what a fish tape is for running wire through a wall? So it was like a short fish tape. It was like four feet long. But when you're doing an endoscope, at, at a certain point in the intestines, you need to like stiffen up the thing a little so that you can get it around this one curve. Um, they weren't getting a patent on, on what they were trying to do. They brought it to me and wanted me to salvage what I could. I got them a design patent on the ornamental appearance of their handle, which was mildly distinct, very mildly. It was a circle, but it had a, 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 another circle offset from that. So it was an ornamental appearance for this endoscope stiffener. Because I figured the doc's doing this, it's really going to be a fine touch. And you don't want to be using one brand in the morning and a different brand in the afternoon that's a little stiffer or a little less stiff. So they're going to want to be brand loyal. And by getting a design patent on the thing, they would know if purchasing it bought like an off knockoff brand. And they could, they could make noise about it. And my guys could say they have a patented design. So like the badge on the front of the car. Oh yeah, well that's a lot of times, like the front end of a Ford Mustang will get a design pack so that people can't make replacement parts. Okay. Um, so generally this is not, I mean I get design patents 99% of the time it's because either I couldn't get a utility patent and they wanted something, or I get a design patent as um, a secondary thing for replacement parts. Well, one of the great things about design patents, A, it's easier to get. I get it 95% of the time, maybe more. Um, it's cheaper to get. There's no maintenance fees to keep it alive. And it gives you a great remedy, disgorgement. So what disgorgement is, is rather than a reasonable uh, royalty, which might be 7% in a certain market, disgorgement means you get to suck all the profits out of the offending party. So all the money they made on this product, you get. And in some like medical device space, you know, it's eventually it's plastic injected stuff that they're selling for hundreds of dollars. So, you know, there's 400, 500% markup. So getting 400% is a whole lot better than getting 7%. So disgorgement's something. Um, and so, you know, like Oakley's gets protection. So you get the idea. Um, and so, and it's everything and anything. So it's things where how it looks is going to help you make the next purchase. So like, you've seen like the decorative shrimp that, you know, they're on like a, a black pan that kind of looks like a wedding cake, you know, it's, it's tiered. And, and so the shrimp go one way and they go the other way or whatever. And so somebody was making a knockoff and they said, oh, you're confusing our customers and they were suing. Um, you know, this is one of my design patents for a client that has a, a way, I mean, this thing works like five feet under water and stuff. It's, they, uh, these guys do what I consider witchcraft and they can, they can talk on the low voltage side of a transformer, send their signal at 20 kilohertz through the protective jacket, go through the transformer backwards, go down the street 20 miles to a switch yard come in asynchronously and people can pick up the signal. And so that way they can remotely control the transformers from one central place. But anyway, well, part of what they do is they have these, these uh, relay enclosures. All right, where I said it's narrow. Oh, and one thing is you don't want to start chasing the design pattern 
until you're really, really sure this is the product I'm sending out. Because I get a lot of product clients, they build their prototype and they think they got it and then all of a sudden, you know, we file the design patent because they didn't listen. And then the plastic injection molding people go, eh, that's not, good. that's not a good idea. And they revise it, revise it, revise it. The same functionality, but it looks a lot different to make the plastic injection molding work better. And just to, to underline that design patents are not chunk change, this was like hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, pro tip, you see a patent and the first digit's a D, that's a design patent. So when you could go to Bed Bath & Beyond and you found a, found a can opener and it was patented, if you looked at it, it was patented with a D, because this, this mechanism, it's a steam dead mechanism that's been around for 100 years. But strangely enough, that mechanism didn't show up until 75 years after the invention of the can. So for a while, they were just like hammering them. Um, at any rate, you can also use them for startup screens on, on stuff. All right, so the, I've covered a lot of stuff. Any other, I mean, we had a couple questions along the way. Any other questions before I get into some other stuff? Yes? I had a question about your thoughts on uh, patents, whether or not they're design or functionality patents, and how they relate to interoperability between products. I mean, telecommunications, you've got a number of vendors out there, and uh, governments and customers want interoperability between those. Okay. And the industry hates it. So, what The industry the, hates patents or standards? Industry hates the idea of commoditizing their hard earned intellectual property by turning it into a standard that anybody can copy. Well, it. All right, so the, did everybody hear the question? Right, so. There's tension between exclusivity and interoperability. And so the way that works is if you have a patented solution and it gets embedded in a standard, whether it's an RF, IEEE, RFC, or whatever, exactly. if it gets embedded there, um, and the only way that one can do it would be by using your patent, then you need to set up a system where you patent, you allow everyone to get a reasonable license and you're non-discriminatory. So if you don't do that, it's an antitrust violation. Um, now, sometimes, let's say that the standard was there had to be a certain level of encryption, but there's 25 ways of doing encryption. So you can have a patent on a way of doing encryption that meets the standard, but you wouldn't necessarily have to license that unless the standard got down in the weeds to your particular way of doing encryption. All right, utility patents. Um, most, 99 times when someone says patent, they mean utility patent. But since we, we were talking about design patents, there's also plant patents, which it kind of like shows the, the qualities of the plant and the, the nature of the mother and father of the plant and stuff. That's a whole other kettle of fish. But if you, were, if you spent 20 years growing a new rose, you don't want people making knockoffs of it. So you want a plant patent. Um, all right, so this is the main form. This is most of the patents that come out. Um, you need to have an idea that's not only novel, obviously it needs to be new. I mean, no one's gonna patent something that's old. Um, but it, you have to be non-obvious to this hypothetical person that is omnilingual, and has access to everything ever done on this topic since the beginning of recorded history, right? So, so like desensitizing toothpaste got wiped out by the writings of a Chinese shaman and also there was a druid. Both of them had written down that you could make a poultice of burnt chicken bones and apply it all sorts of places, including gums, to alleviate pain. And it turns out that the active ingredient in burnt chicken bone poultice was blah, 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 phosphate, which was the same fundamental ingredient that was in the desensitizing toothpaste. Uh, all right, so that, that covers two things. One, this is hard, because they get to view stuff from all over. Um, two, the patent office didn't, wasn't conversant in the writings of the Druids or the Chinese shaman from a thousand years ago. 
And so stuff slips through, and then when there's litigation, they get to challenge not only whether they're doing what the patent is calls for, but whether the damn patent should have been issued to start with. And so they were they were running up the bills when they were hiring, you know, cultural anthropologists and medicinal medicinal historians and stuff in all these different languages to find this stuff. Um, when I used to I used to work at Fish and Need, which was you know they represented Bell with the Bell Telephone and stuff, and you know the Wright Brothers and all that. So they were big stakes patent litigation. Um, but they would hire, you know, they have an expert in cigarettes, an antique cigarette museum in London. People would fly out to like compare all the, all the samples from all around the world to use that against, you know, somebody in a cigarette litigation. Um, I've had, I've submitted an image from Courier and Eyes, which I thought was surprisingly close to something that one of my clients was doing. The uh, Supreme Court on their own motion took something from the uh, Tales of Hercules. And it might have been a North Carolina patent because it was a process for flushing out hog waste from a, from a hog barn where you periodically like flush and go. And you know, generally the Supreme Court's got nothing as far as patents. The Tales of Hercules? Yeah, the Tales of Hercules just said he, one of the seven tasks was he diverted the, uh, the river to clean up the Aegean stables that had 7,000 horses because no human could possibly clean that out. And he diverted the river to clean it out. I said, well, that provided the suggestion, motivation, and teaching to do this. So, and the attorneys are like, oh, God. <laughs> um, all right, so what is a, what, what is a patent? When you, when you get a patent, you get a bunch of claim. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that explains stuff. There's pretty pictures, and there's, there's explanation of this, that, and the other, and there's some explanation of what the problem was they solved. At the end, there's these claims, which are kind of a cross between a technical manual and a haiku. And depending on how strong the priority is, like when I'm fighting, I'm trying to fight at the haiku end. I don't want to be at the technical manual end. So, and the other thing that's weird, by law, it can only have one period. So you have this thing that's like this long, it has paragraphs in it but only one period, and so you do all this stuff with semicolons. So English teachers everywhere, you know, no reading patents without supervision. Um, all right, so when you get a patent, it's just a toll gate. So what it does is says, you can't do this particular form of encryption without my permission. Um, now, depending on where your toll gate goes to, it could be, these are all pretty good toll gates. They look pretty, this one's as good as that one. But some are worth more because that path is worth more. People care more about it. So you get 15 bucks to cross into Manhattan over the two or three ways into it. You're not going to get 15 bucks to cross into Kansas because there's 16,000 different ways of getting into Kansas. Kansas. All right. Um, yeah, and uh, getting a toll gate, it's a toll gate. It's not a bulldozer, right? It doesn't give you permission to blow through other people's toll gates. It's not a license from the federal government to make your thing. Um, so, yeah, just remember that. And it's amazing how many people went through law school, got their MBA, did all this stuff. Nobody knows the difference between a toll gate and a bulldozer. I have to keep explaining it. It's a toll gate, not a bulldozer. All right, to drive this home, you know, bed, Brilliant Betty came up with the beach bike, right? That two wheel inline chain driven vehicle, you know, simple, nice, right? Later, Mary comes in with the mountain bike. She comes into the patent attorney and says, I, I have cantilever suspension and I have an 18 gear shifter and I have a front fork that's dynamic and it absorbs the shock, but it doesn't, it doesn't cause a loss of your momentum and blah, blah, blah. So the patent attorney will say, oh, Mary, I can get you punches in patents. <coughs> but after she gets the patents, well, certainly if Mary gets a bunch of patents on the mountain bike, Betty can't make a mountain bike. Betty can make her own little simple Betty bicycles because nothing Mary did could take away from Betty the right to make the beach bike. But 
to marry make a bicycle? I don't know. It kind of depends on what's in Betty's patent. So if Betty's patent is kind of broad and says two wheels, inline chain, steer by rotating a, a handlebar over a front fork, pedal using your feet, that's a mountain bike. Now, fortunately, if, if the, the broadest claim in Betty's patent doesn't mention the whole coaster brake thing, then Betty's golden, right? Because Mary's not using coaster brakes. She's using the hand brakes and stuff. She's not using the old style brake like when we were kids. She just pedal backwards and broke. So, depending on what's in Betty's claim, Mary may be out of luck and not be able to make a bike without Betty's position. Because remember, patents a toll gate, not a bulldozer. How about electric bikes? Uh, well, we'd have to look and see what's in there. We'd have to look. So what you do is you look at Betty's claim, and then you look at every noun, and every verb, and every relationship, and see whether it maps onto the other one. So a pure electric one might not be driven by a chain because you may, the motor may be right there at the wheel and may direct drive the wheel and you might not have it uh, drive. And it may not be, the motive force may not, depending on how you do it, whether it's a hybrid or whatever, you may not actually pedal the electric bike. Um, but if, if Betty had four things to name her patent, and it was this and this and this and that, then then Mary would have to have all of them. There's the so all elements rule. Okay, so Mary could definitely use two of the elements, but not all four. Right. Um, all right, so just let me know that we're watching the end. Yes, so, okay. and a lot of times when I'm doing freedom to operate and design around stuff, all I'm looking is for one thing that we really, really don't have or we can live without. Okay. And, then, and then, so that's why it's a general rule of thumb the value of a patent claim is inversely proportional to its length. Gotcha. So, so you, if you want all four, you'd have to get four patents. Is that right? Well, see what happens. All right, so this, this happens for once. You you seek a patent, and a lot of times when I'm doing stuff, it's, I view this as a negotiation. So if my my broadest claim, I think, eh, probably not going to get it. But then I have special sauce down. So like, Mary might have. The bit about the cantilever suspension or the front fork as separate dependent claims, which add on to that. And when the examiner came and said, well, claim one is too broad because of Betty's patent. But claim seven, if you add seven and one, I can allow that. Or if you add 10 and one, I can allow that, because that's a different thing. Or 15 and one, that combination is also patentable. A rookie who's sloppy would then have a claim that's 1, 7, 10, 15, all clumped together in one thing. Then if people just skip one of the things, but I would get an independent claim that's 1 plus 7, so nobody could have a cantilever suspension. You know, 1 plus, um, no one can have, you know, a gear shifter. 1 plus you know, the front fork with the gas cylinder and you can set it for two different modes or whatever it is. So there's some art to this. And, and I like to think of it as a negotiation rather than there's some people that think that victory is coming up with a claim that initially gets it allowed and first pass through. That's kind of like people that put their house up for sale and 60 people try and give them a check that day. It's like, well, maybe, maybe could have asked for a little more. Um, <laughs> all right, so what can you do is, you know, you can try and make, even though you have something inventive, you might need to do some freedom to operate searching, see what's out there, and make sure that you know, you know, if I get this patent, am I going to be able to do what I'm going to do? Um, right, so it would be a tragedy if Mary built her whole factory and then found out um, all right, and so some people say, I just want to opt out of this patent stuff. I don't want to play this game. 
Well, yeah, tell the IRS you don't want to play the taxes game. I mean, there's certain games you're in, whether you're an active participant or not, you're in. Because um, what happens is, even if you're not copying, you may come up with the same solution. So the American Flying Squirrel and the Australian Sugar Glider are indistinct. You cannot tell them apart. There's a couple of little holes in one of the skulls. But they are about as closely related as Bernie is with the, the Flying Squirrel. It's just the same good solution came up in two different places. Happens all the time. Watson and Crick, we think of them as working together. They were working against each other trying to come up with the structure of DNA. So it happens all the time that people are coming up with the same good idea. And once in a while, my inventors get blown out of the water because we find a pattern where the same right. When we were in, you know, tenth grade, eleventh grade, and we took a physics class, right, and we had a problem and we wrote out an answer. There was a right answer because we had a limited number of tools, and we all came up with the same solution as to you know how fast the boat would go down the frictionless plane or whatever. Um, in the real world, there's a lot more variation, so it happens less often, but often two people get the same right answer. And they're not copying. Um, if they do copy, then we hammer them. We get a special hammer for that. Because otherwise, with game theory, you'd say, what the hell, I'll copy. They sue me, I'll pay a reasonable royalty. And, and maybe they'll, they won't sue. So in game theory, you would say, I should always infringe. Well, the way you, you fight that is you say that if they knew of the pattern, and they said, the hell with them, we do it anyways, we can triple the damages. Um, all right, now is Mary's patent worthless? No, in many ways not. First of all, since Betty's patents happened a number of years earlier, eventually Betty's patent will expire and Mary will have a free reign. Um, and then she could also challenge, just like I said before, with the the druids and the shaman and stuff, she could look for prior art and try and kill Betty's patent. And she could say, well, the main thing when Betty's patent was a chain-driven, you know, wheel, there was this high unicycle, they had a chain-driven wheel, so there's a chain here between his pedals and the bike. You know, I'm gonna try and invalidate her patent and be done with it. Um, and then the other thing, and this happens all the time, people like Mark over there who do deals, back rooms, and they solve problems like they cross license. So Betty and Mary get together with their attorneys. They license each other. Now they have a patent portfolio for mountain bikes. Betty gets to make the expensive high dollar mountain bikes. Mary gets to make mountain bikes. But Cindy the cloner now needs to deal with both sets of patents because now there's a unified firm. And it happens all the time. Um, all right, any more questions? I think we're coming close to the, the witching hour here. All right, yes. Best mode. Must teach the best, or words to that effect. Best mode. That used to be some. It's still a requirement, but it, they, it's harder to sue on that. What, what does that mean? All right. So if I come up, um, I come up with a new formula for making a tire, right? And I get a patent on the general idea. But I know that generally for best durability, I need to have the ratio of this to that rather than being, you know, anywhere from one to a hundred, the ratio. If I know that the ratio really needs to be in the range of 40 to 42 in order to make, really make it work, and that's in my claims, then I need to share that. So you, you, can't, you, can't, do, you can't have a patent and a trade secret on the same thing you patent. Now that doesn't mean, and, and frequently what happens is you file a patent, you're still working on stuff. Years, a couple years later, you figure out that the optimal range is, you know, should be a, a ratio of 40 to 42 rather than, you know, some broad range. Um, you don't have to go and rewrite, you can't go back and rewrite the patent. But you just need to not hide the, the truth when you file the patent. So is the intent of that that when the patent expires, somebody else can... The purpose of the, pa the patent system was the original Wikipedia, right? I mean, 
It was a way that we collected information and had it in a place that others could use it. So that basically every patent should teach somebody how to make and use your invention once you no longer have your token. And the reward was exclusivity for the rights to the rights For a limited period of time. Okay. Right. It's actually, um, when they wrote the Constitution, um, there's a place where they listed a very short list of things that were really important and Congress needs to get its ass together and do. It's like, deliver the mail, have an army, have a navy, regulate the interaction between the federal government and the Indians. Um, it's a really short list, but on that list, um, so that's section one, clause eight. So in section eight of that short list, it's they need to come up with systems to reward um, inventors and authors. So that's the mandate for them to come up with the patent system and the copyright system. And it also means that the Supreme Court has a seance and tries to figure out whether Ben Franklin would think that a you know, modified microbe is something that should be patented or whatever. Versus my friends that deal on the trademark side, that all comes out of the catch-all, which is that Congress needs to regulate interstate commerce, which is 99.99% .99 of all laws all fall under that. The 1964 Civil Rights Act came out of the Commerce Clause, not the 13th Amendment or the 14th Amendment or anything else. It came out under the Commerce Clause. So, so the trademarks, they just need to do something that seems reasonable for protecting commerce. And pretty much you could make an argument that anything's reasonable for protecting it. So, um, so yes, so the best mode is still a requirement and I ask my people to do it they used to litigate that a lot. And you can imagine, you get a big company, six different engineers, one might have thought that this was the best way, and someone if, and so they could always find somebody who had a note memo to file, I really think we should do this. And uh, then they try and say that they purposely held the best mode. And it went round and round and round. And now they've taken that out of, they've made that almost impossible to sue on. You mentioned engineers and companies, how did those work? How, how do engineers work at companies? Well, in, individual and, and companies. Is a company patent or an individual patent or do they share? Generally, just like when I have a contractor come and build me a house, when it's done, he gets paid and it's my house. The fact that he built it, it's no longer his house, it's my house. Same thing if you're an engineer and you're selling your time to IBM or Wolfspeed or whoever, um, they own your stuff within a reasonable scope. Now, it gets, gets funky when they start trying to say that your invention of a better way to throw lawn darts that you did totally on your own time is yours. And there's a North Carolina statute that specifically protects inventors that are doing stuff that have nothing to do with their employer's work. But, but how about if I take my builder's design and then build another house to sell to somebody? Well, it depends on the copyright and stuff. That's a whole separate issue. But um, so yeah, it happens, and, and I deal with this all the time because like my clients will subcontract out. They'll like use Galera, which is a medical design shop that's here. So like my my heroes that were making the 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 needle with the filter, they were using Galero. Well, there's engineers working at Galero. They assign off into Galero, and since my clients pay in Galero then I assign over to my client, and then we record the ownership. I mean, you do it all the time. So it's just a, it's a question of expectations, and you need to be careful if you're doing loosey-goosey contractors or hiring subcontractors or hiring subcontractors, and then are doing something with somebody overseas, and there's, there's no real duty to assign stuff. It can be a mess. Um, just like if you get a website built, you need to make sure that you understand who owns the website, who owns the code, who owns the copyright on the images and stuff. Because if you're loosey goosey, you can be a mess. Um, so. Is work for hire restricted in North Carolina? Work for hire is a copyright issue. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know the full limits of it. The problem is if, you, if you're not really careful, and sometimes people will have it in there, they're, they're within the law. There's frequently a default value, and then almost all default values can be overridden by what's in your contract. 
And so what ends up happening is there's often battle of the forms. There's a purchase order, then there's an acceptance order, and it's like, well, who's, whose set of stuff counts? And that's, that's contract law, and we're not going to go there today. But uh, so generally, you got to look at these things and look for trouble and then have your attorneys figure out. And then it's better to find a potential problem, run it to the ground, resolve it before you do it, rather than spend all sorts of money and then go, oh my God, now what do we do? So, because um, there are a lot of badly written agreements out there and it just causes havoc when people later try and figure out. Um, I looked once, there's, there was an agreement that they owed royalties for as long as they were building Learjets. You know, 100 years later, are they still owing royalties? Is it still a Learjet? I mean, is, is it a Learjet? Is it called a Learjet if they change the name? I mean, so like, there's a lot of badly written agreements out there. And then when you write them with some level of precision, it ends up being more like a computer program because you sort of have your exceptions and, and how you save things and stuff. And you, you kind of go through all the possible things that might happen. Um, all right. Um, Yeah, that, that's, that's old school, and that's a way, there's, there's a rule against perpetuities in law, yeah. um, and so that's a way of, of having a really long agreement, um, but that's a whole separate issue there. Um, so, any other things that you were hoping to hear tonight that I didn't touch on? It, it might, might not be related, I, I have a personal interest in my son does uh, on internet videos caught up with uh, 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 algorithms reviewing his videos and, and trapping him for uh, DCMA violations when he's commenting on a film and taking a clip from that film and then doing it, you know. Yes, yeah, so that's more of the fair use exactly. category. And exactly. there's a lot of stupid stuff that's going on because a lot of it's been delegated to computers. My wife was, during the Zoom period, my wife was making videos for the church where she was working in, in Durham and these people were trying to assert copyrights but she had licenses to the music and they yeah so at any rate so there there is stupid out there and unfortunately um sometimes they they, they know it can just be a nuisance so and you'll pay them some money so um and another thing that's sort of a recent thing is now one of the most important places to adjudicate IP rights is Amazon. Because if someone's making an infringing good, you don't have to go to federal court. You go to Amazon. You show them your patent, they review it, and they take down all the, all the products. All the links go away. And so you do this strategically, and you got an uh, offending product, and then you, you take everything down from Father's Day, and you know they, they can't redesign anything. They're stuck with product they can't sell or whatever. So that's a place, again, where design patents, if you're worried people are going to make a clone off your stuff, you don't need to go to no stinking federal court. You go, to, you go to Amazon, show them your design patent, and so this is their product. You know, it doesn't even matter whether it looks exactly like your product. It just needs to look reasonably close to the, de the design patent, and they'll take the URLs. So that kind of plays into the question I was trying to form in my head about you know, what, what keeps companies in China from taking an idea They do, and, and what stops them frequently is patents, because you can actually, it's a whole separate one, but you can use, um, I'm not sure if you can use design patents, you can use a utility patent, and you go to the customs folks, and there's a whole separate ITC um, thing, and it goes with six months to the president's desk, and he signs an order, all imported goods that are infringing this patent get seized by customs and destroyed. Um, well, yeah, so, so if it's coming in, if it's already here, then you wouldn't use that road. You'd have to sue them, or you'd call Amazon or do something else. If they were selling it, they were oh, no, oh, that's a great question. Oh, let, me, let me answer a bigger question. Um, so when you get a U.S. patent, that applies to things that are made, 
used or sold in the United States. So if someone makes something here and exports it to Canada, you can chase them. If something's made in China and imported to the US, you can chase them. If something's made in China and sent to Canada and never crosses in the United States, your US patent doesn't do anything. So if you want, um, if you want protection other places, you get a Canadian patent, a Chinese patent, and a Europe, there's the European Union. It's, it's, it's a little different. But anyway, you can get patents in Europe, in Brazil, wherever. Now the problem is, it's impractical to get a patent everywhere. So you generally do it where you're going to have significant amount of sales, or a place that's a manufacturing hub. Like if you were doing a semiconductor patent, getting protection in Taiwan was a smart idea. And for certain things, like Israel is kind of the tech center for the Mideast. Sometimes you get a patent in Israel, even though, and that'll sort of squash a lot of sales in, around Israel. Um, all right, so I went back and addressed the bigger question. Do you have any residual question left? Um, I just want to remind that the Canadian patent system is very Yeah. adding a slight variation to it to then pick up where it is. And like with pharmaceutical companies, I think they sometimes have uh, something that's expiring and they go, well, now it'll be in a different pill shape or something. All right, well, let's, let's go back to what normal people would do and then we'll talk about pharma in a second. <laughs> so when Betty's patent expires, as I said, you know, the patent system was kind of the original Wikipedia. So now Betty's patent and Betty's product teaches us all how to make it. So it's like, you know, when there's lots of things that have gone generic, right? So you don't have to add a twist. Once Pat Betty's patent's expired, you can make a damn identical thing to Betty's. Um, and that's fine. That's what we want to have. But if, if Betty is not making, she's been making not models also under this broader pattern. Sure. And then, but then now Mary's come along and says, now I'm going to add this other thing. It's going to be mountain bikes also. Can now Mary go back and go after Betty for her? Oh, to squeeze Betty out? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we're getting twisted in the hypothetical. If, if Mary and Betty had cross licensed each other, then, you know, you would do whatever this, the scope of the license was. So if the license said that she had access to the four original. Mary patents, then she's golden. Um, if she said she's only had access to it up until the point that the Betty patent expires, then that's the rule too. I mean, you, with a license, you can kind of make up whatever rules you want, and then you got to live by it. Um, and then people make incremental improvements to stuff all the time. I mean, the company I worked for, you know, represented Bell with the Bell patent, which was all screwed up, but they they fixed it for me. Um, but people are still filing improvements on the telephone every week. So people are still making incremental improvements on stuff. Most things are incremental improvements. I mean, it's rare. I mean, one of the special powers of patent attorneys is we give things names. So if, if something's never existed before, a lot of times we'll give it a name. And the, the client will say, well, I already have a name. I'm going to trademark that. I go, oh, wait, are you paying attention to the slides? I don't want to use your trademark as a noun. That'll make it generic. A trademark is an adjective. So I need to come up with a noun. And so I need to, and all frequently, not only am I naming the thing, but I, I'm naming like the little pieces that jut out, and the, the indentation and the through holes and all this stuff. Because, you know, my thing, like this, by the time I was done describing it, might have a hundred nouns. Easy to describe. So sometimes you get down to a point where it's like, I don't know what the name of that is, so I have to make it. Um, now, you're not supposed to use the word widget. There's a rule against that. <laughs> and if you, if you try and patent a perpetual motion machine, you're supposed to submit a working example. <laughs> <laughs> yes? What about copyright? If, if I write a book and publish it in the United States, can somebody in England publish it? Copyright's the also a function. There's almost nothing that's international. And in fact, oh, one of my pet peeves, you know, 
poked me. Occasionally you'll get run into someone who goes, I got an international patent. It's like, no, you don't have an international patent. <laughs> I mean, just like there's the front end now for your kids and grandkids that apply to college, there's like the front end, and so you fill that out, and then you can kind of shoot that to 100 different colleges rather than typing the same stuff out 100 different times. There's the same thing on the patent system. It's called a, a Paris Cooperation <coughs> Treaty patent. And so it's a patent application that's the front end for like 156 systems, including the US. So you file that, and then it gives you the right to then extend from that into individual countries. But during partway through the process, they publish it. And so people go, I got an international patent. It's got, no, you have an application that's the front end for 156 systems. Um, Um, yes, there are things for, but again, the PCT is a front end to allow you to get stuff other places. It does you can't sue somebody on your PCT application. Now, with, with copyrights, there's the Berne Convention, and a lot of times that facilitates the process of going other places. I don't, I'm not up on the details on that. I do it with design patents, like some of the design patents I've recently obtained. I filed under the Hague Convention, and then that allowed me to, for a lower cost, get protection in Canada and the EU and a couple other places. But some places aren't participants in the treaty. Um, and, uh, and so like I had to do Taiwan separately, because there's, Taiwan's not in a lot of the international treaties because people get upset. China is not China. So, so a lot of times you have bilateral agreements with Taiwan rather than international agreements with Taiwan. Yes? Your thoughts on the one click patent for writing online shopping? <laughs> yeah, see, people a lot of times say that when you actually go and look at what's in it, um, a lot, first of all, the lay press doesn't do a good job with law to start with, and they generally do a worse job with patent law. So, you know, people have been making noise about that for a long time. Um, chances are, if you actually read it and saw the, the number of nouns and verbs that were required, you wouldn't think it was this big a travesty. Like, for a while, there was stuff, I think when Amazon was first starting out, which allowed you to, to kind of get, you, you placed an order, um, let's say one of the local McIntyre's bookstores wanted to have their order fulfillment done by Amazon, right? So you went to the, the McIntyre Bookstore website, you clicked on a URL. Well, then that URL had fields in it, so it said the name, the ISBN number for the book, and then it also said that this sale was made by McIntyre Bookstore. So it went into the Amazon distribution network, they fulfilled the order, sent it out, but they knew to give percent of the sales back to the original seller. So that was a slick solution that allowed, basically once you set up the URLs, you had it was on autopilot, you knew who was getting credit for the sale. So that's the kind of stuff where you can get a patent for something and people who don't know any better might say, oh, they're patenting e-commerce. It's like, no, they're patenting this specific solution that allows a royalty to flow in this circumstance. And if you don't want to do it that way, do it some other way. So they were they weren't patenting the one-click solution, they were patenting what was under the hood? Generally. Yeah, you, almost never do you get, um, do, you, do you get like the idea, like the big, big idea. Okay. Um, and I'd have to go back and look at it, but a lot of times people say stuff and you go, eh, they don't. Just like people say they have an international patent. Or they say, you know, I got myself a provisional patent. Well, there is no provisional patent. There's a provisional patent application, which is a, rough draft of a real patent application that it gives you a year to decide whether you want to polish it. That's all it is. People think that provisional patent application is magical. And worse yet, people think that it's a placeholder. That basically I can just put down the title of my invention as a provisional and fill it in later. That's worthless. Totally worthless. So what's the length of protection on all those uh, items you mentioned? They vary. Um, you know, copyrights, they, they, people used to joke that copyright will continue to get amended so that Mickey Mouse is never in the public domain. Um, so, but like, 
Like, I think Winnie the Pooh's finally in the public domain. A lot of the stuff, it goes a long time. For copyright, it's a long time. It used to be like the author's life or whatever. It was a long, long time. Trademark, as long as you're using the mark. So it could be forever. Trade secret, as long as you can keep it a secret and anybody cares. There was recent litigation about um, trade secret on the all-important how you make nooks and crannies at it, Thomas English Muffin. Yeah. Their process created bubbles late in the baking process, so that it created those big voids, those big craters when you cut it open, and it did a better job sucking up a lot of butter. And the guy left that company to go to another English muffin company, and they were suing to make sure he didn't reveal the trade secret of how they made the nooks and crannies. And the, um, so patents, um, the actual definition of the length of the patent takes about this long. A short definition is it's 20 years after you started the process, you the, the rights end. Now it takes you usually takes you about three years to get the patent, so that usually gives you about 17 years of of toll gate. Um, but there's all sorts of complications to that. Um, so and a, a design patent is 15 years from the time it issues, not from the time when you first started. Five, five, is it, one, five, five, one, five. five. Yeah, it's relatively short. And other systems have other kind of variants. They have like a petite patent, which it's more like a utility patent, but they don't really examine it, and you have less power, and it's easier to defeat. And then there's um, there's other things that are like design patents in some other systems. There's like some models. Um, but anyway, for now, if you go home and you know don't need a plant patent unless I came up with a new form of rose or something. Um, utility patents are kind of the home run, but a design patent can be the right solution and, and you can get both. Um, copyrights are relatively easy to get and they're good to use against people that are really sleazy and have physically copied stuff. Um, trademarks are useful to have so that people come back to where you are to do what you're doing. It also gives you superior rights if you have a dispute about URLs, you know, domain names and stuff. Um, and so, but it gets complicated because that whole island thing, you know, who should get the delta.com, you know, URL if there's six different deltas that are on different islands. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that, you know, like Omega and, you know, unfortunately for a while people got all sorts of companies were named after the Egyptian goddess Isis, and then there was the terrorist activity, and, and people were like, X day, X day on the yeah. Isis name. So, and you know, I remember um, people had this whole new computer programming thing, it was like application independent development system, and they were about to roll that out, it was like, all of a sudden AIDS kind of came on the scene of like, oh, new name, new name. So. All right, anything else that I didn't touch upon? You were going to have a look at Parma. Say what? You were going to tell us what your thoughts on Parma uh, Well, Parma, a lot of times, will add a very small incremental stuff. And I understand them doing what they're doing. What I don't understand is why the doctors put up with it. I mean, I've had a doctor say, well, I could give you the purple pill, not that purple pill. Just a purple pill instead of the red pill and the blue pill. And that means you just take one pill. And I go, well, how much is the purple pill? And it was like, you know, $117. How much is the red pill? Well, it's off patent, so it's like two bucks. How much is the blue pill? It's like five bucks. I go, I'll take two pills. It's not that hard. <laughs> I don't need to pay $117 to take a purple pill instead of taking a red pill and a blue pill. Um, so I don't understand why the doctors. I mean, partially because of our insurance system, a lot of people are isolated from the cost and it's over here and whatever. So I don't know why they put up with some of this because a lot of the improvements are not really that much of an improvement. Advertising. Yeah, I mean, that's part of it, but you know, I'm cheap. I mean, I'll, I'll do cheap if cheap makes sense, right? Because if I get the same. I mean, this is the only country in the world that will have sponsors for advertising. Yeah. <laughs> We're also, speaking of that, we're also the only country, one of the few countries in the world, that allow me to get a patent for a doctor for a surgical method. 
Most countries expressly prohibit that. But there's a twist. In the United States, I cannot sue a doctor or a hospital for violating the surgical method path. And then you might think, what in the hell was the point of doing it? <laughs> so I can sue Medtronics and Stryker and all those people because they sell kits for those things. So for most surgeries now, you buy a kit to do whatever it is. And so like there's this guy who's a surgeon, I think. Um, Mickelson was his last name. His first name escapes me. But he was like the first guy to really think about minimally invasive surgery where you're going in through you know, a series of straws and he patented the whole water burn, right? He got patents on everything in all the countries, right? So eventually everybody caught up. They all had the same bright idea and they eventually got there and they all wanted to go in and do keyhole surgery and laparoscopic surgery and all that stuff. He had patents on all that stuff. Um, eventually, he sold out his patent portfolio to Medtronics after suing the hell out of him for a while. He, he licensed, he, he assigned that stuff over for close to a billion dollars. Um, and I tried to design around some of this stuff. Because a lot of it was, you put in like a really thin pipe and then you put a thicker pipe around it. And then you put a thicker pipe around that. And so gradually, you have a bigger and bigger hole, but it, each step was small, kind of like the boiling in the froth. And, uh, and then you have a big enough hole that you, you have a tube, you can stick something through, and then you can you know, clip off the appendix and pull it back or whatever you're doing. Um, so at any rate, so yeah, I get method patents on, uh, on innovative ways of doing like spinal surgery. Um, to go in through the psoas muscle so that you can slip that open because it's really, it's really tough. Because the psoas muscle has to be really, really strong. Because like, if you think about a teeter-totter, if, if I got a 40 pounds out here, I got a quarter inch of space back here. And it's got to have enough stuff to offset this times all this distance. Absolutely. So there's, the muscles around your spine are just ungodly strong. But sometimes you need to get in there to work on the spine, and you got to spread that apart, you know, rip it open, but you don't want to hit the nerves. So anyway, so some of my guys came up with innovative ways of doing that. And a lot of their pieces, when you look at the pieces, they're not that exciting, but it was the sequence of steps of using those pieces to kind of pry it open. Okay, I, I think I'm going to raise your hand a couple times. I'm sorry. One of your slides, you had said um, the patent is expensive. What's the general price range or minimum? All right, so. If we're talking the utility patent, right? So there's essentially a couple different costs. There's the cost to write it. And if you're talking to people that aren't as forthcoming as I am, they kind of just focus on that and the cost of writing and filing. Well, if they leave out is there's this whole middle part where the examiner's coming back and saying, well, I could combine this piece from here and this piece from there and this piece from there. And therefore, even though your thing is new, I deem it to be obvious, and then I need to absorb all that stuff, know it probably better than the person who wrote those patents, and then spoon feed back to the patent examiner why you can't add all those things up and, and render my guy's thing obvious. Well, that frequently takes, you know, 10 hours of my time to read all that stuff and do all that stuff, that spoon feed back a 30-page document. You know, I bill at $5.75 an hour, which is relatively cheap for my level of experience, but 10 hours times that, Bucks, right? Frequently you have to do that more than once. So if I'm doing it twice, we're at you know a good 10 grand in the middle of the process. So suddenly, you know, even if we got the patent application written for seven or eight, um, and it can be much more than that if it's a complicated medical device with multiple embodiments, you know, suddenly we're looking north of 15 if things go reasonably well and it can go, it can drift above that. Because um, a tail end, I have to explain to you how to mark your products so you don't forfeit damages and there's other stuff that goes on. And in between, we also gather up all the information that you have that the examiner could use to deny you a patent. That's part of one of our jobs is to hand over the stuff that would help them say no. Just like you tell the, the IRS when you run a lot of money off a of mark playing poker because that's income. And you, if you want a thousand bucks off of hand, you need to report that as income, and the IRS wouldn't have known about it.
unless you told them. So you have to tell the IRS about the income, and I got to tell the IRS about you know your PhD thesis, which was on point, but the examiner probably doesn't know about, and is halfway to what your invention is here. And the examiner gets to use that as a building uh, building pad to try and deny your patent. I'm hearing upwards of fifty k. No, I mean it's a lot. I mean. Like, I just finished a patent. I was going to have dinner with the client. And when it was on the low end, it was a relatively simple device. Um, and I looked at my total costs, and we had some office actions and stuff, and bumping around with the examiner. But it, it still ended up, it was about 14K. Um, but I have others where we fought hard with the examiner, and we had, like, interviews with the examiner, and where there was all sorts of stuff where the clock was running. And it can easily get, you know, 22K or whatever. Um, so it varies up depending on the number of embodiments, um, how hard the examiner fights. Like sometimes there's literally 200, 300 nouns that I got to discuss. Other times there's six nouns. And I recently obtained for one of our local inventors a patent on a way of feeding horses. Where there's horse hay nets and there's this, she has this neat way that you, that you put the, the net on this like clamshell thing. And that was relatively simple to describe. Now, a lot of times it's simple to describe and then the examiner fights you harder because they go, well, that was simple. And then they, they sort of start out with the, with the premonition that it's obvious and then you gotta fight harder in the middle. Uh, versus like if I'm writing a patent on some weird ultrasound machine where there's only three people on the planet that understand it, and they explain it to me, so now I understand it. That was a heavy lift to get me up to doing that, even though I have a degree in biomedical engineering. And then I explain it to the examiner, so the examiner understands it, so now five people on the planet understand this special thing. That's a heavy lift. But then it's, it made it clear sailing <coughs> to get it to the next step. Although once I had one of those, and the damn examiner on the phone, thankfully, you know, it was a conference call. Fortunately, the client was in the room with me. The examiner said, yeah, I knew your patent was obvious. I go, well, it's not obvious. What, what, what made you think it was obvious? I understood your patent the first time I read it. It's like, I was trained to really make an effort to do that. Because I worked at a big time litigation firm and their stake on it is, you know, technically we're supposed to write the patents so that one of skill in the art, you know, if like somebody that's got a, PhD in ultrasound can understand it and figure out whether it's an advance or not. I mean, so that's like the level I'm allowed to talk at is, you know, kind of quick. You already know all this stuff. Here's what we, here's the new stuff. And that's what I'm allowed to do. But we were taught, write it so that somebody that stopped taking science classes in 10th grade could have a general idea of what problem you were solving and why it makes a damn difference. Because that's the people that's going to be on the jury. Everybody with a PhD in ultrasound is going to be kicked off the jury. And the judge can have no clue. And the judge has to like make decisions on this. So you want to write something that general people, non-specialists, can understand why this matters and what the special sauce is. So, yes? Uh, so in, in, in software, a certain line of code is measure of complexity. You're implying that the number nouns in the, uh, that you have to define and defend in the patent is, is a measure of complexity? Well, a lot of times you'll explain it because you have to enable it, yeah. right? And then, like I said earlier, a claim is kind of like a cross between a technical manual and a haiku, right? So if you, the first guy came up with a gas grill where you didn't need to use a match to light it, right? So the patent office would like you to take the, t the assembly manual, take all the periods out, and make that whole thing a claim. You know, so you'd have every damn lock washer and every piece in it, right? And so somebody else might be able to design around it who's yours, you push in a button, there's they slide, you know, one's using an electric, electric field, another's using flint or whatever. I'm trying to fight to be on this end, like the haiku end, generate fire without use of match. 
right? Yeah. So I don't care whether you're pushing a button or sliding a slide or a foot pump or what, you know. That's, I don't always get there. I've gotten pretty close to that on a couple things. Okay. I don't normally get there, but that's where I'm trying to go to make it really hard to design around it. And I get a better chance of doing that if I have multiple embodiments. If I showed three or four different ways of doing it, then I'm more likely to get one of those big umbrella claims. But the patent office is going to be trying to force me over here and over specialize over. And, and in my line of work, we disparagingly call that a picture claim because it's got so damn much detail in it that the only thing that's going to infringe it is a, is a, clone, a clone that looks just like a picture. And that's not, that's not a good day's work. All right, I've gone over, so we need to get home and yeah. do what you need to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was great.